This, um, unlike what I've done in the past, it seems like in the past when I've taught this, it seems like I do this about what? Every three years, something ends up coming up where it's time to teach Revelation again or something where it's eschatology, end times. And um, is that, you need to set the extras right there. That's fine. Thank you. And um, it seems like to come up about every three years because we have questions. And it seems like by attrition, enough events are happening in the world that people have questions. And um, then you have another group of people who think end times stuff is overrated, it's blown out of proportion, it's not that important. There's, and there's certain people even within the reform camp where it's like, seriously, you know. So, but here's the thing. Um, here's a couple questions, a couple of lead-in questions to look at, and, and we can discuss a little bit. And this is the reason why we're going to get into this and, I want to um, kind of roll into this, take a slow roll into this, and not be, feel like we're under the gun and we're going to get all this wrapped up in six months or anything like that. I don't know if we're going to end up going into, uh, or how deep we're going to end up going into certain books. At, the, at a minimum, we're going to be doing kind of like an overlay, an overview of um, major chunks, at least of Daniel, because you have to. And also Revelation, obviously, we have to do a good overview of Revelation. If not, we'll have to talk about, pray about um, verse by verse in Revelation. That um, it's, it's a good book to go through anyway. And, and whether it's all in one sitting or if we call it a clean break and we say, okay, for the next chapter in this thing we're doing, we're going to do a study in the book of Revelation. It could end up that way. Let's pray about it and see. But part of what's going to help me figure out exactly what we're going to do and, and the approach is um, I don't want to assume anybody knows anything about eschatology, about the end times. And I want to assume that everybody has some questions or at least incomplete knowledge. So when I'm saying some things, I don't want to feel like I'm insulting you with, with things like, does anybody know where the book of Revelation is? Well, that's the last book in the Bible. But I'm not trying to insult anybody. I just want to make sure everybody's comfortable with where we're at and um, make sure nobody is walking away with any assumptions. So if you have questions, that's what this format is for, is, is to ask questions. So this is the Knights of the Round Table. Hey, the Knights Bible Study. There we go. Um, I'm just kidding. We don't have to do that. Um, but it would be kind of cool. Sort of. Sort of. Sword? Sword? No. <laughs> Man, that's a triple yeah. pun. You got to give me props for a triple pun. I absolutely do. Okay, or, or drink a little more coffee. All right. Oh, so yes, sir. I'm just looking to see if you guys are awake or not. So, let, um, I've got some questions. One is, and I want some discussion about it. I don't know how far we're going to get this morning, like I said, but let's find out. Um, is end times prophecy, eschatology, is it important? Um, why or why not? So let's entertain that a moment. It is important. Okay. And I will argue that it is important because it reflects the times now. Okay. Uh, so it's very contemporary to where we're living it, in the world. It is. Uh, what, what we see happening now in the world are everything or is everything that has been predicted. And I see the storm falling on Israel. We do uh, see that I'm happening. Watching, I'm watching the news. I'm watching uh, this other stuff. And it is absolutely flabbergasting. Mm -hmm. uh, flabbergasting that it's happening or flabbergasting at how close it's getting to Biblical descriptions of the end times, uh, or both. Or? I'm gonna I'm gonna argue both. Both, right? Where we were all raised. Um, I was raised Baptist, right? Berean Baptist. Oh, okay. Uh, that's how I was raised. And when I see what's going on now, I see I see prophecies facil uh, fulfilled. Mm -hmm. um, it's scary 
and it's also uh, relieving, right? It, I can be scared at the same time and also be relieved. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm scared for what's going to happen, but I'm also relieved in the fact that he told us it would happen. I don't know how to I don't know how to articulate it any better than that. Well, I mean, I think that's fine. I, I think I think one way we can articulate that would be um, the comfort that comes with it and the relief that comes with it is realizing that if God predicted it, sovereign God is in charge of our future and our our future, well, however it shapes up, is in His hands. It's not out of control, right? Somebody no. once said that the world is not falling apart, that the end times is not falling apart, it's falling together. Words to that effect? I agree with that. That's, that's what I think. I think what we're seeing now is fulfillment of the prophecies. And um, I have subtle joy in that. Uh, to what I mean is, it feels horrible that it has to come to this, mm -hmm. but it was also what it was. It was what's predicted. Yeah. And, um... Well, so, of course, what comes with this is the cautionary tale that if what's coming upon the world, if coming upon the whole world, as Jesus said in, in Revelation 3.10, if something like this is coming upon the whole world to test those who are upon the earth, who are living on the earth. And that's a cautionary tale that we, for the very end things that are happening, we don't want to be here. I mean, it's going to be pretty horrific. And then it begs the question, well, are we going to be here or are we not? Because we know of the, of the doctrine of the rapture. Premillennialism is, is um, pre-tribulation. So when you're talking about end times, the arguments come up where... Um, you will have perspectives like there is a pre-tribulational, means before the 70th week of Daniel. Morning. There is a, the argument that, well, there's going to be a rapture before all of those things happen. So in many ways, before the book of Revelation events, all those horrible things. Um, other perspectives are and what was really popular back in the old days, I, I think especially during uh, World War II and so forth, was um, a, a mid-trib rapture. That was very popular. Now, that, it, since the 1980s, that's morphed a little bit. And now what's really become in vogue is what's called uh, a pre-wrath rapture, which means, well, we don't know that it's going to be right in the middle of the tribulation, but there's supposed to be a rapture at least before wrath hits because these people at least recognize that uh, as we get in um, Romans 5, 1 Thessalonians 1, and we can take a look real quick at those passages, and in um, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 and 5, that wrath is not for the believer. And then you'll get a, another school of thought that, okay, there's going to be a rapture, but it's right at the very end of the tribulation, and then Jesus comes back. Okay, now as far as how the millennium, or if you want to call it a millennium, some people won't call it a millennium because milli is where we get, it's where the word thousand is, right? You run a mile, and it's so many. Okay, so the word milli has to do with thousands, okay, so thousand years, and they say, no, we can't say it's a thousand years, that there is a millennium, but there is a kingdom. So that you got one school of thought that is, that is that there is no millennium, that there will be a kingdom. Um, one school of thought says there will be a kingdom, not really well defined, but it will be on the earth. Premillennialism is that all this stuff brings us up to kingdom age, and that will bring us up to a point where there will be a thousand year kingdom on the earth for a specific purpose, not that a thousand years is up and then being the turkey timer goes off and then we don't know what happens. There's some specific events that happen leading up to that point, but that's premillennialism. So there's a, a post-millennial 
most of those schools of thought. And there's three or four varieties of each of these, okay? There's a good, weird mix. It brings confusion, and that's what I'm trying to highlight here. So if your head's swimming a little bit right now, you're not alone, and that's just what I'm trying to illustrate. So there's a school of thought that this kingdom's going to go on, and it's going, going to go on here on the earth, um, but the rapture that happened, there's either not going to be a rapture, or if it does happen, it's at the end of the tribulation. I think, can I, I'm sorry, can I interrupt? I think sure. that's what I see a lot of now when I'm talking to people, is the confusion between, like, you're talking about wrath. Mm -hmm. There's wrath, there's judgment, and then there's persecution, and people get those three mixed up, and I think that's a lot yes. of what is going on. People, you know, I think there's going to be more persecution, or we're not under, but those three things I think I'm looking forward to seeing, people, you know, the pulling those apart and going, yeah. you know, persecution and judgment. I mean, judgments, we're all under God's judgment, that's all, but wrath is something completely different. Yeah. And, yeah. and that's exactly the kind of stuff I want to get into. So yeah. the, the very last school of thought, major, broad school of thought I want to point to is a school of thought. Uh, all millennialism is popular too, but post-millennialism, what I was just formerly talking about, is really popular. But all millennialism, that there's not a thousand years, there's just this time where um, the Lord, it's going to get horrible, but at some point, we don't know when, the Lord's going to step down from heaven and, and so forth. But he's already in his kingdom. The kingdom is now, the kingdom is up there on earth, but at some point, the kingdom and all is going to come back with Christ. Or another school of thought is we're all going to go up there and be with the Lord forever up there. So there's a couple of different schools of thought. And the, so to your point too, Hillary, there's, yeah, there's confusion about all of these things. Now, Let's, let's take a look at some of these statistics here. So I, I'm, what I'm trying to do right now is I want, I want to bring you to a point of, of recognizing and seeing the confusion. And what we want to do in this class is we want to get, get at a proper hermeneutic interpretation of Scripture. How do we arrive at what the truth is? Because some of these people are really learned men. They've written lots of books. They stand in the pulpits. Uh, they give a lot of seminaries or seminars or whatever they teach in seminary. And yet, there's so much disagreement. So, what do we what do we have to do to interpret that? I want to I want to get at that during this class. But let me let me real quick let's let's look at let's get the lay of the land. We're gonna have more discussion, but let's get the lay of the land because there's more about this. You know, is in times prophecy eschatology important? Why or why not? So let's get into why it might be important. Let's continue. We might not get past this first point today, but let's try. All right. So why Jesus must return to earth, okay? Let's take a look at this. I think this is fascinating. Okay. Um, we are, according to Titus 2, 13 and 14, Paul said, Paul expresses that he is waiting for our blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior Jesus Christ who gave himself for us to redeem us from all lawlessness, okay, and to purify for himself a people of his own possession. I think this is ESV. A people for himself, a people for his own possession, who are zealous for good works. So there's a couple of things in here. Paul is looking forward to our blessed hope. Now hope, to clarify without getting belaboring it too much, hope is as often as the case, means something different when you get into the original languages, when you get into the Greek, for instance, than what we sometimes understand it culturally here in America and in, in Western thinking. We hope, like, oh, I sure hope Grandma brings that pecan pie she makes every year for Thanksgiving. See what you got started this morning yeah. talking about turkeys? <laughs> now I'm getting Thanksgiving on the brain. So I hope, ooh, I hope. So it's, it's you don't know. In the Greek, it's entirely different. And Kevin could probably tell you what the word is, but the word hope, what it means to convey from the Greek in this passage is an expectation. So our hope is our expectation. So our expectation is Jesus Christ. So this is what Paul is expecting, is the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. This is a great deity of Christ verse, by the way, great Trinitarian verse. Um, but look what it does. This hope that he's expressing here, um, it is about redeeming us from all lawlessness and to purify for himself a people for his own possession who are zealous for good works. And, and this is magnified even more. Look at the next verse, 1 John 3. 
Beloved, we are God's children now, and what we will be has not yet appeared, but we know that when he appears, we shall be like him because we shall see him as he is. And everyone who thus hopes in him purifies himself as he is pure. So that hope has a purifying effect in us, or it should. And that is the entire point of this, is that if you have this hope and you know the Master's coming pretty soon, then i got to be ready. I mean, my Master's coming, the Lord's ready. So it's purifying for the church. Because, you know, as, as proverbially, you don't want to be caught with your britches down, right? You don't want to be caught in sin. You don't want to be caught not caring if he comes. You want to caught, live, be caught living in the way that he wants you to live. So that's part of the effect of that. Okay, now let's blaze through the statistics. If we blaze through this real quick, then we'll have more discussion because I'm sure more questions are coming up and more that you guys want to convey, more thoughts about where we're at today. Okay, so this is fascinating. Prophecy occurs in the fifth of the scripture. Now, this is all prophecy. This could be prophecy about Genesis 3.15, about you know Messiah coming someday, you know, from the line of Eve, okay? So it's all prophecies. Now, the second coming accounts for one-third of that. That's significant, right? There are over 660 general prophecies, 333 concerning Christ. Now, general prophecies meaning there might be a prophecy about Tyre and Sidon being destroyed, that kind of thing, okay? But 333 of these concern Christ. Of these 333 prophecies, just 109 were fulfilled in Jesus' first coming. This leaves, the lion's share, you could say, most of them, this leaves 224 yet to be fulfilled in his return. So is the second coming, is eschatology important? You know, when you've got most of the prophecies out there still waiting in the wings, it is. Of the 46 Old Testament prophecies, prophets, less than 10 of them speak of the first coming, 36 concern his return. In the Old Testament are 1,845 references to Christ's rule on the earth. Did that happen? Is that first coming or is that second coming? Second coming, right? 17 Old Testament books give prominence to this. In the New Testament, 318 references to his return. These are mentioned in 23 of the 27 New Testament books. Next to the subject of faith, the return is the most dominant in the New Testament. For every time in the Bible the first coming is mentioned, the return is mentioned eight times. For every time the atonement is mentioned, the return is mentioned twice. Jesus referred to his return 21 times. Thoughts? Is that overwhelming or what? But surely for us it's those people that are like, we don't have to worry about it. We don't. We don't. You hear a lot of that when you want to talk about the times or the times or, you know. Yeah. Well, what, I get pushed back, and this is another one of those things I, I get pushed back a lot of times from, um, you know, I, I consider myself really um, in the uh, reform camp, but in the reform camp also are um, people who are all millennial. There's two camps. Now, I, I tend to fall, count myself more in the camp of Dr. John MacArthur, Dr. Michael Vlock, and many others who are premillennial and are more dispensational. There are Reformed people who say, you can't be dispensational and be Reformed. And they will be all millennial. So I, I posted a little article about it, my thoughts about it, and had a lot of people jump in and agree. I didn't have not one person disagree with this assessment of... Um, those two camps and the argument between those two camps. 
And this was the little article, it's short, but I'll read it to you, and you can tell me if, this is, if you've run into some of this and if you've noticed. And I said, um, I've noticed that when speaking with some of the Reformed camp, um, particularly in the Amio camp, that when we press Scripture concerning the promises of the Lord about Israel, that they're irrevocable. When we discuss the kingdom on earth in Daniel's 70th week, with many scriptures demonstrating this, proving this, that we're frequently waved off with eschatology doesn't matter, it's not a salvific issue, it's not important. In other words, you lay out all these scriptures from the Old Testament saying, look, look, Jeremiah says this. Look, Isaiah said this and all these things, God's promises. The Lord says, you know, I'm going to bring you back into the land a second time. Now, the first time Israel was dragged out of the land, what happened when they were removed from the land? What was that? Remember the Babylonian captivity? And the Lord restored them. But during all this time, the Lord's talking about things, that judgments that's going to come for Israel, and we will be getting into these texts in the Old Testament, and they are numerous. And But the Lord tells them in words, that, but I'm going to keep a remnant, don't sweat it, and I will bring you back a second time into the land. So that begs the question a second time. Two things. One is, okay, so there's another time we're going to be kicked out of the land? And we know historically that this happened roughly around 70 AD. But also, we also have to ask ourselves, well, wait a minute, it doesn't mention a third time, so that means whenever they came back a second time that they're here to stay? Okay, so those are things that you ought to put in your hip pocket when you're reading, I think that's in Ezekiel, and we'll get into that. But there's all these promises. Romans 11 is a huge one about God's promises for Israel. Look, I'm going to do this, and I'm going to do this, and, and I'm going to do this, and you're going to fail. You're going to fall on your face miserably. Don't sweat it. Other sheep I have. And the Jews are going, other sheep? What, are you, what is he talking about? And he brings about all these pro prophecies about the end and where he's going to bring them to. And he's going to see them through it. And then he's going to, there's going to be some judgment, but he's going to bring them into the kingdom. And the son of David is going to rule. And all these kinds of prophecies. Well, teachings were going around in the first century that that isn't so, that this wasn't going to happen. And Paul was saying in Romans chapter 11 that, you know, God is not slack in his promises. If, if God is going to, if, if God is going to make his promises based on merit, then we're all in deep trouble because we'll all fail, right? And Paul says, be careful because God's prom, what about God's promises to you and your salvation? You don't know that he's going to keep those promises and you're going to go into his eternal kingdom, right? So if God can slip on his promises to you, to Israel, what about you? What about your salvation? So don't get cocky about, you know, concerning Israel. So the Lord brings this up. But when you start bringing these questions up, people push back and they go, end time stuff, Israel, it's not important anymore. God's moved on. We're the new Israel. We're the new, we're, we are God's fulfilled Israel. There's different terms. Israel blew it. They crucified their Messiah. Now it's all about church. And we'll talk about some of that. And we'll weigh We'll, we'll look at this in a balanced view. Is that correct or is it not? And, and we'll weigh it in Scripture. But what I want to do is I want to point out in here, um, one of the things I like to point out is, uh, I, I, in the article I point out, the somewhat cavalier way eschatology becomes uh, labeled as unimportant is um, seems really to come up from those on the defensive but sometimes we nod and we say, yeah, that's right, about some of these prophecies. Because, because they'll say things like, well, that's apocalyptic language. We don't know what that means. That's apocalyptic language, and we don't know what that means, and it's not important. God's done with Israel anyway. So we have to look at those. We have to weigh that and say if this is true or not. Um, and then they'll mock, and they'll say, you know, yeah, you, you pre-mills, you um, dispensational types, you know, like Hal Lindsey with his, his, you know, Apache helicopters in Revelation. Ha, 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 ha. You know, or they'll point at um, different people who've made false prophecies about the rapture and things. So you point at the worst possible example and you say, yeah, you believe in that stuff. Ha, ha, ha. You guys are ludicrous. And that's what we call a stall, straw man argument, right? And you can, you can do that in both camps. And we want to be honest with Scripture. We want to handle it with integrity and see what the scripture really say, because I know I don't say that. I don't even think Hal Lindsey says that anymore, although he did in his book in the 1960s, The Late Great Planet Earth. Well, that sounds a lot like, you know, those creatures with the wings spitting 
fire out of its tail and, you know, hurting people and all this kind of stuff. That sounds, six wings, that sounds like an Apache helicopter and stuff. And, you know, kudos to Hal Lindsey for being one of the early voices to bring people uh, into the mindset of when is the end times? Are we there and what it looks like? But I don't think he even agrees with that type of a thing anymore. So wrong symbolism read into scripture can happen on both sides. So we want to acknowledge that. So now from there, now that hopefully I've got your juices flowing of what's going on with the different confusion and so forth, and all the con- confusion about um, the differences in all these. So how are we going to arrive at what the truth is? I, what I want to do is, this is for you to take home, and we will talk about it. Pass those around. Certain principles to understand. Um, concerning what we call hermeneutics, and that's just basically how to understand or how to read the Bible. Okay, These are certain principles to apply, and we will go over these. So I'm just going to throw all this at you right now, and then we're going to discuss. I'm going to present the problem to you, that there's a problem and there's confusion, and now... That confuses me. We what? Now we're going to try to, we're going to try to unscrew the inscrutable, right? Yes, sir. Yeah. Sorry. It's all good. So thoughts so far? Any more thoughts? When Pastor Davey said that if God is through with the Jew, then what's say he's not through with the people? Yeah. If he, if he breaks the covenant with the Jewish people, then what's to say he would as a birth? That's it. Romans chapter 11. So what is the the, um, impact for the church? If it matters and if it doesn't matter, what is the impact for the church, which is us, by the way? All believers universally in the world, what is the impact for us if we're in the end times? One is you could say, it shouldn't matter then because we get to party and fly out of here. No, sir. Okay. Well, the other one is... um, other side people will say is that uh, it doesn't matter. So see how the arguments go? The other is that well, we got to get out there and do some arm twisting. We got to go out and tell everybody about Jesus. You got to hold a gun to their head. We got to do whatever we can. We got to bring people to the Lord because Jesus might come and they might miss the boat. And so all kinds of people that we're supposed to talk to, and we're not going to get real deep in this, you know, they're going to fail and they're going to go to hell and it's going to be because of us. <laughs> Partially. Partially. Well, I mean, that in principle could be, you know, an argument that you could make. But God is sovereign. What did the Father, or what did the Lord say in uh, the book of John, in the Gospel of John? It says that he wouldn't lose even one of his sheep that the Father gives him. He won't lose any of his sheep. He's sovereign. Remember, he's in control. My brother used to say back in the early 70s that. Everybody's waiting for the rapture, but the rapture can't happen until the last person who's supposed to get saved is. As if, not that God's also in control of time and the way things are going, but now God is up there twiddling his thumb going, man, this is going to go on until the year 2424. People are dying left and right, and I can't come back until everybody's saved that's supposed to get saved. So God is waiting on us. That's a fallacy. That's a fallacy too, you're right. So what does it mean for the church? What's the right balance? What are some correct perspectives, some correct ones to look at? If I may. Sure, go ahead. Uh, the correct balance, in my humble opinion, as a uh, sorely sinful Christian, okay, is that we are to represent what we have available. That we are represent. Christ in our best, right? You do what you can and let God sort out the difference, right? We're not, we're, so we're we, are not we are not um, holy, right? We are sinful creatures. Uh, we have our own sins, even Christians. Mm-hmm. We have our sins. We hide them from each other. Mm-hmm. Uh, we hide them from ourselves, but we can't hide them from God. Mm-hmm. And the best we can hope for is that God 
uses us to the best of our ability. So are we going to do that on our own and try to convince people based on our own testimony or our own thoughts and ideas? That Tell is, people uh, how it should be? Uh, no, no, sir. That is not what I'm suggesting. No. How do we do it? Uh, what we do is we continue in faith. We continue in faith, but also the other way is that I here's my third authority, and it's the final ultimate authority, right? So if I'm going to share the gospel with somebody because I am a wicked individual, I mean, I completely and totally relate and agree with you. But my words and my opinion don't matter squat. Yes, sir. And that, so, it, that I think that's what I was trying to articulate, but yeah. I didn't do it well. No, no, that's fine. I'm just, that's why I'm clarifying, and that's what Thank we're you. here to do. Yes, sir. That's what we're, we want to make sure we do. Is, is the, So I that means it's I, important we know the scripture. I believe the Bible is the absolute truth. Amen. All right. Um, and we can argue about translations and all that other stuff yeah. on a, yeah. uh, uh, on a uh, philosophical level, if right. you will. Right. But the bottom line is God's word is preserved for us. Amen. No, every religion always has their own representatives. For example, the Muslims have the caliphate or the sultan. The Catholics have the pope. The Orthodox oh, have like the spokesman great type or something yeah. like that. Uh, ours is the Bible. That's it. Right. The old Bible is the Lord's representation on earth. It's well, because it's the it's the written word that is a picture of and very much represents the living word, right? And who is the living word? It's just you know, Jesus. Jesus. I am the Word. Yep. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. I read that somewhere. I think I read it in the Bible. I did I did read that in the Bible somewhere. Okay, now, the other question. <clears throat> yeah, it is. It's Juan. It's Jesus is there in Juan 1-1. One, one. Uh, so, okay, now, you mentioned the stuff that's going on over there in Israel. So there is some stuff going on over there, and we are going to get into it. Does the Bible really talk about this stuff that's going on in Israel? I mean, arguments are made, and there's some merit to a degree in some of these arguments. Arguments are made that, well, they've always had trouble in the Middle East, and this is true. Or there's always been tribu trouble or tribulations in the Bible, and the church has always been under persecution in some faction or another, somewhere or in many places in the world, all these things have always been happening. So what do we think of those arguments? Do you agree that that, that is true? And what's the I difference between now? If I may speak up, and I, I apologize for being overly vocal, but yes, it has been happening. It has been happening for many decades. Mm -hmm. It's been happening since the first century. Uh, however, not to the degree, not to the degree that it has been happening now. What's going on now is everything that has been predicted. I believe the Bible is telling us what's about to happen, what is currently happening. You know, is, uh, foretelling of what the near future is. Okay. If I worded that too correctly, I apologize. I, I've been saying a lot lately, and something kind of offended me this last week, and, you know, I had to be like, okay, God. <laughs> you know, as Christians, we don't have a country. We, our, our country is the kingdom of God, and they're everywhere. You know, the only country that we should be paying attention to is Israel, because that's his chosen people, and that's the next phase of his plan. So I was I was at work and someone came through the window and she goes, look what I got at the fair. And she's a, she's a good Christian. I prayed with her. And she pulls out this cross made out of wood she got at the craft fair and it had the flag overlaid on it, painted. And I was like, <laughs> you know, and I, 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 I was like, okay, God, put my finger up. I was like, well, it's pretty, you know. So, good but, intentions, but, but misinformed, but whole, this, misapplied. This is not, it, the United States isn't in the Bible. Right. You know, it's not, let's fight for U.S., let's fight for this, and this is a bad country, and this is a good country, and this is, you know, it's just we find our identity in the wrong things. Mm -hmm. And we need to be looking at, okay, we're Christians, and we need to be praying for our brothers and sisters everywhere, and then just watching, like I said, watching Israel and watching. And people just get so, their identity in things other than, like Trump, you get talking to people about Trump, and you're like, dude, he's a man. 
He's Dial not the back. savior. You know, yeah. this is not where we're at. And fighting what's going on in the world to some degree is fighting what God is doing. Mm -hmm. I mean, the world's getting ready for the Antichrist for, you know, and, and we have to we have to look and see where God is working and not what we want or where we find our that's what the Israelites did. They found their identity in the temple, the building, and not in Christ. Yeah. So. Well, one of the things well, I want to emphasize is when it comes to what we're trying to do here at Grace Community Church of Appalachia is keep it biblical. Yes. So when it comes when it comes to that, and you look at these things, is, is you got to go well. It, does this have merit, and does that have merit? And you could make arguments, and you could you could forensically go and go look. The founding fathers were believers, and a lot of people believe that, and so and that may or may not be true, and that's not our purpose. What we're here though. This country was founded on godly principles. Blah 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 blah. Okay. True or not, what it comes down to, you can argue that all day long and people will go back and forth and they do. But the question is, okay, but we've got to, we've got to focus on Bible. We've got to keep it biblical. So how do we sort this out in Bible? And Hillary, to your point, what I think we need to do is go, okay, we keep our eyes on, on Israel because there's, for some reason, God does not explicitly mention the United States. He does not explicitly Mention Australia or Canada or a bunch of places in the Bible. It's all about the Middle East. I mean, I guess, you know, it could have been, I don't know how thick if he decided to tell the future of each country, but it's all concerning the country through whom, the nation through whom, the people through whom he brought up the Messiah, introduced the Messiah, and he made lots of promises about the Messiah and concerning their people. And it's in here. So if something's not in here, then we want to, you know, kind of push it out of the way. We want to kind of, you know, we, those are all philosophical arguments that are not important in the big picture. We want to keep it biblical. We want to, th these are the kinds of things that are creating some, some confusion. Sorry. Back on subject here. Let's, let's get on subject here with, so, all right. So do you have your, did I get rid of mine? You have your little, uh, Principles, hermeneutics, things here. Let's let's take a look at this because we got a little time left, that we, and I want to don't want us to walk out of here without some kind of homework that we can look at when we go home and we consider these things because we're going to start really getting into the text next week. Okay, so some of the some of these principles about how to understand scripture. Now this is this is worded in different ways. These principles and in different orders at different times. But basically all of these principles are pretty much the same that you'll find in um, good hermeneutics books and in classes and so forth on how to understand the scriptures, okay? So I want to make sure we understand this before we go on and before we leave here, before we go home. So um, four principles should guide us when we interpret the Bible Literal, historical, grammatical, and synthesis. Great, those are some good, there's a couple of $2 words in there, what do they mean? So let's get in, let's unpack that a little bit, okay? The literal principle. I want to make sure we're all on the same page with this. Scripture should be understood in its literal, normal, and natural sense. That's what we mean by literal. While the Bible does contain figures of speech and symbols, they also they were intended to convey literal truth. In general, however, the Bible speaks in literal terms, and we must allow it to speak for itself. So what do we mean? In other words, we want to let the text interpret the text in the sense of the context that we're in. When you're reading the Bible, and Jesus is speaking to a group of people, and we've probably heard this example, this example before. And he says, I am the door. Are we to understand Jesus is saying, in the literal sense, I am wood, some hinges here, and here's a latch. Of course we don't. So that should be our go-to, though, when we are trying to understand Scripture, is we try to understand it literally or normally in the way we we know to run away from that and to understand it as a figure of speech or as symbolism is if the wooden literalism, literalism say that five times real fast, mm -hmm. if that doesn't work, okay? Um, an example of that. 
We've all probably read at one time in the book of Revelation about a great red dragon with seven heads and ten horns. And we say, wow, okay, so much, am I supposed to understand that with wooden literalism that that is going to be a creature out here stomping around somewhere on the earth? Well, there's a couple of things to apply. One is you have to look and see, is there a creature like that in the real world, in nature? If not, you've got to say, well, then this might be figurative language here then, because God could do that if he wants to, and he certainly could, but am I to understand it this way? But as you read the text, it goes on to explain itself. As you read the text, he goes, and here's what the seven heads were. And and, um, here's what the ten horns are. And he starts to describe the seven heads in in, um, symbolism like seven mountains or seven hills, seven countries, if you will, okay, territories. And, and the ten horns are these ten kings. It starts off with like 13, and then two, eight, and one, and all this other stuff. So you go, okay, so this is figurative language. And then a little horn rises up. So he talk, starts talking about the Antichrist running this whole massive. So this is this big dragon, this big beast. Dragon is also used frequently in the book of Revelation to, do, to be symbolic of, to be exemplary of, um, and explicitly about Satan. Because he says a few times in the book of Revelation, and the dragon, who is Satan, it says that a few times in the book of Revelation. So then that should be the light bulb going off over your head going, okay, so this is symbolic language. But other than those types of examples, that's how you kind of differentiate. And you you want to try to keep literal and interpret the Bible normally. Like you're reading a, a regular, normal book. Just take it for what it says. And then when you run into something like this, a great red dragon, you run into something that is, I don't know. I'm reading in the Bible, and it says that um, this is another Hal Lindsayism from the 1960s. And it talks about Israel, and uh, the Antichrist is going to go after Israel. And I've done this myself, and I've reformed my thinking. I keep reforming my theology over the years, but I mean, I've done, done this myself, you know, in the past. So uh, the Lord says he's going to send a great eagle to come and he's going to bear Israel on its wings and he's going to take them to the mountains in the east. Oh, that could be an airlift. You know, that could be an airlift. Well, the eagles could be angels. The Lord's going to use angels and he could drag them off into the hills. Well, eagle, that's interesting because we're the only ones who are really on Israel's side and the eagle is our national symbol. So it's got to be a great airlift from the United States taking Israel to the mountains. And you can make arguments for that, but the problem, there are, there are a lot of problems, but is that the best go-to we do? That's what you call, or has been called, um, newspaper exegesis. You, you take what we know from the world around us today, and you try to insert that into scripture, and that should be the last place we go to. We want to understand what's going on in the world through the lens of scripture, not understand scripture through the lens of the world. Yeah. Now, what, what we do find is if you go to the book of Exodus, you'll find the same language that the Lord sends Israel along with a great, you know, with a great eagle out of Egypt fleeing into the promised land. So he fle- flees them, helps them flee out of Egypt. What that means is swiftness. God bears them divinely, supernaturally, helps them to get out without being pursued by the Egyptian army, and he helps them in their flight, in their flight out of Egypt. And that's the way we should understand it. Because this is another principle, and we'll see this in here, is that we want to apply how it's been used in the past, in the Old Testament. We want to bring it into the New Testament. We don't want to impose common modern day conventions and culture and impose it upon the scripture. Okay? So that's the literal principle. Everybody, any questions about that? I no, went to work one time, and we were talking about all this weird stuff, aliens, whatever, and then they brought up Ezekiel's wheel. And I was like, what? And I was like, no. So I pulled it up, and I, I, I'm i scrolling down. I'm Eric like, okay, Von Daniken. Here's, 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 here's what he's saying. And it says, yeah. what he, and he's like, oh. yeah, I don't think that's what that, and I'm just like, uh, uh, I'm going to jettison your opinion of what the Bible says, because yeah. I like the, this is woo, I kind of like the woo-woo sound, so let's yeah. stick with that. We listen, folks. We don't want to do that. You know, we want to we want to jettison the woo woo and stuff of what the Bible actually says, and we want to try to keep it biblical. 
Okay, the historical principle. Moving on, let's, let's see if we can get through this. It's questionable, but let's see. <laughs> this means that we interpret, the historical principle means that we interpret Scripture in its historical context, and that's some of what I've just been speaking about. We must ask what the text meant to the people to whom it was first written. That's a good principle, right? Would they have understood Apache helicopters and airlifts in those days? Probably not. Now, John was confused and did see some things that he had difficulty explaining. And whether it was uh, you believe that that John was actually um, time traveled to the future, or whether it was a vision or both, because we got some weird stuff starts happening in Revelation chapter four, right? And Paul expressed there was a time when he had a vision or was taken up. He said he was actually taken up. So some st weird stuff like that can happen. We understand the scripture will record some things that are incomprehensible and those poor guys. Daniel, Daniel at times, he had to go crawl up in a little ball in a circle on the floor and whimper for himself and I'm surprised he wasn't sucking his thumb. And the Lord had to come and say, you know, come on, Daniel, get up. Let me help you up and calm him down because the prophets did see some things and witness some things that are incom incomprehensible. But I'm not saying that. What I'm saying is, by the historical principles, we've got to understand that these prophets and these apostles, when they're trying to communicate to the people what's going on, they're going to use language and they're going to try to convey things that they can comprehend. So if we don't understand a, a turn of speech or phrase or whatever's being conveyed, we probably want to go back to the Old Testament. We don't want to unhitch from the Old Testament, okay? Despite advice to the contrary. Um, in this way, we can develop a proper contextual understanding of the original intent of Scripture. Now, this is the grammatical principle. This requires that we understand the basic grammatical structure of each sentence in the original language. To whom do the pronouns refer? What is the tense of the main verb? You'll find out you'll find that when you ask some simple questions like those, the meaning of these of the text immediately becomes clear. Now, this is something that I appreciate, Kevin, and you'll learn to appreciate if you don't already, what Kevin is ex exceptionally conscientious about, and he does really well. Um, but there are tools that you use, like uh, a, a pastor, a teacher, lexicons, Bible tools that you use, Bible dictionaries, commentaries, and that's a, more tools that you want to bring in because before you go to the, the thing about Ezekiel's wheel and you want to start applying some weird, bizarre stuff to it, let's look at what the text is actually saying. Let's go to the original languages too. So before we come to that conclusion that he's talking about UFOs in Ezekiel, let's examine and weigh all of those. Um, the synthesis principle, this is very important. This is what the reformers call the analog analogia scriptura. I'm not great at Latin. Analogia scriptura. Did I pronounce that right? Analogia. analogia scriptura. It means that the Bible doesn't contradict itself. If we arrive at an interpretation of a passage that contradicts the truth taught elsewhere in the scriptures, our interpretation cannot be correct. Scripture must be compared with Scripture to, to discover the full meaning. And it, I just understand it this way, folks. You know, I'm, I'm a simple guy. Let's understand it this way. Um, although the Bible was written by many men over you know, a 1,500-year period, roughly, who is the author of the Bible? There's one author, right? He inspires God. the Scripture. He's not going to contradict himself. He's not going to have John say something that contradicts Jesus or that contradicts Ezekiel or Daniel or whatever. So if you've got a couple of passages that contradict, then you've got to take a real close look at that. Now, sometimes this is intentional. I can think of one place in the Proverbs where Solomon did this. In one verse, he says, answer a fool according to his folly. In the very next verse, or the other way around, he says, answer not a fool according to his folly. He's trying to illustrate. Sometimes there's language that's like that, hyperbolic language, where he's using hyperbole to illustrate a point. 
So you've got to realize that hyperbole comes into the picture here sometimes, the too. in that case would be that you can't answer a fool. Right. You know, and, you, and, and that's there's great studies that you can do on that. That would take at least an hour to do, and, and some great illustrations about that. So you got to understand the scripture does do that. So the point is, is that if you've got a, a, the types of um, contradictions that people are usually talking about when they're talking about, especially in time or salvation issues, and you've got things that contradict, and you're probably understanding something incorrectly. But understand this too. MacArthur was, was fond of pointing out how that every great doctrine in the Bible um, seems to be contradictory on some level. Every great doctrine in the Bible, you've got, um, on the one hand, um, God is one. Hear, hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one. Yet, it's indeniable that we do have scriptures in the Bible where we have um, Yahweh described as God. We have the Father mentioned, and clearly he's God. We have the Son described as he's God. And we've got the Holy Spirit, and he's God. So we've got three persons, one God. So there's some things that are outside of our human comprehension that we take on faith, we understand. And we understand it because keeping it biblical, the Bible says it. So I'm not saying all these things are easy, but these are principles that we need to apply to try to unwind some of this and try to understand it. Is that clear as mud, or is that <laughs> understand? Am I confusing things, or you get what I'm saying? Get it? Yeah. Okay. I think the word you use, seeming, is the most important, because there are no contradictions right. in the Scripture. It's a seeming contradiction, and one of the golden rules of all hermeneutical principles is that you always use the clear to interpret the unclear. Always. That is the first hermeneutical rule. You use the context, and you always use the Scripture to interpret Scripture, because only a diamond can cut a diamond, right? Right. So you're always going to use the clear principles of Scripture to interpret the unclear purposes of Scripture. And one thing you'll learn is, is when you do like an Old Testament or a New Testament survey, there is the entire Bible is not summed up in one sentence or one paragraph. Amen. There is an unfolding of everything. And so you're always going to use the, the most clear and direct and literal principle to interpret those that are unclear. Amen. There is no contradiction. That's why the word seeming is very important. Amen. And we do this now. You, we, I, one thing I didn't know is when I studied hermeneutics, you, you, you do this now in English. We, we do all of this now in the English language. You just don't realize it. So when you look at the grammatical principles, you don't really realize that you already do this when you're listening to the English language. You just have to apply that to the Greek, the Hebrew, and the Aramaic. It's the exact same thing. You just don't realize, you just take it for granted. You know, if I said that we're all sitting at the table, well, you already know who the pronoun is, we. That's very simple, right? Now the key is just to take that and cross it over into the biblical languages. That's the key. Excellent, yeah. It's like I mentioned the word hyperbole, and you go, I don't know what that means, and I don't know, I don't think I've ever used hyperbole. Really? <clears throat> if I've told you once, I've told you a thousand times. That's hyperbole. You know, if, if you don't get up, off your seat and go clean your room, I'm going to box your ears. You know, we use this type of language all the time. So to your point, yeah, so now we just need to understand that there's some cultural differences, cultural hyperbole, cultural language differences that we in the Western world don't fully understand and we need to apply those principles to what we're trying to sort out. The synthesis principle. All scripture will agree with itself. And then the, this really is a, a, a this really is a principle. Apply the Bible. Um, it's a it's really a fifth principle. But what good is it if we have um, this intellectual comprehension of the Bible and we're not applying it in our lives? Right. I know about the end times. I know about salvation. I know about Jesus. I know about about about. We all know, really, if I remind you, Matthew chapter 7. Remember the people that are caught in surprise in Matthew chapter 7. 
before the Lord, where one day we're all before the Lord and he's going to be um, talking to everybody before him at that time and folks are going to be find themselves condemned. Okay, They're going to find themselves standing in judgment and they're going to be surprised and they're going to say, Lord, Lord, didn't I do this in your name? And didn't I do that in your name? You know, because I knew, I know Jesus. You know, I know who he is, or I know him. And Jesus is going to say, depart from me, you workers of iniquity. I never knew you. That's my greatest fear. <clears throat> it's a real fear that, that we all have to deal with in our individual lives. We have to take care of. We have to, that's, this is what we take to our knees, on our knees before the Lord. And we, that's one thing that's really important to understand about Revelation. We get into this all the time. Revelation is not an event. It's a person, right? We know that it's about a person. And knowing Revelation in its entirety, to know every symbol and every event that happens is absolutely useless unless you know the who of Revelation. And the who of Revelation knows you. Yeah. And well, that's absolutely correct. Say we go back to your Titus 2, 13 and 14, he says, people for his own possession were zealous for good works. And we've covered this in James. It's not just the works, it's obedience. You have to join Christ in what he is doing in his work, not just out doing whatever you feel like is a good, oh, I gave all my money, but if that's not what God is calling you to, it's nothing. Right. So the good works are obedience to his leading and his work. Right. Yeah. Well, and the, and the important way to, under, to understand a, the obedience and the works is I keep my eye on the fruit of the Spirit. Yeah. It's the fruit of the Spirit. It's not my works that I do to get saved or to keep my salvation. It's the evidence of faith. If you you don't have those works regular in your life, where a fig tree produces what? Figs. A grapevine produces what? Grapes. If you say I'm a fig tree and Jesus goes to pluck a Fig off of you. What, what happened there in that scenario in the in the Gospels in Matthew? He cursed it, didn't he? And he... That's why Revelation is a great comfort. So when you read Revelation and you look at the way John, uh, again, the syntax of what he talks about, it's about comfort. Revelation is a comfort for those who Christ knows. Those who have hope. Christ, that's right. So Revelation should never be scary to the redeemed, ever. As a matter of fact, that's why it's called the Blessed Hope. We look forward to that day because it's a comfort for us. If Revelation is scary for you, that should be a cause for concern um, about your walk. And that, that's a great time to reevaluate and do that spiritual inventory for you. Is If Revelation is very scary, which I've heard many people that I get to meet during the day say, oh, Revelation is just so scary. Why? That means that there's a problem. If Revelation is scary for you, you may not have that comfort and that eternal security that only Christ can offer. So if Revelation is scary for us, that's the time to reevaluate the profession of our faith. Let's, let's, Agreed. let's try to wrap up, because we're, we're getting close to the end of what we're going to do with Bible study. Let's try to wrap up by, by turning real quick to, to that point here. In 1 Thessalonians, let's look at chapter 4. The first thing I want to do is, if you look at, at chapter 1 real quick, you can look at verse, start in verse 9, chapter 1, verse 9. Um, For they themselves report concerning us the kind of reception we had among you and how you turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God. Amen. And to wait for his son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, Jesus, who what? He delivers us from the wrath to come. So we don't see wrath. In, in Romans 5, where's the verse? I know that's in Romans 5, verse 9. Since therefore we have now been justified by his blood, much more shall we be saved by him from the wrath of God. So we're saved from the wrath of God. Yeah, verse 9. Thank you. We're actually, verses 7 through 9. It's a great passage there. So we're saved from the wrath of God. So that's important, right? Let's look at chapter 5. Let's skip ahead here because we... Um, now concerning the times and seasons, brothers, you have no need to have anything written to you. Which is a strange thing for the Lord to say if you're going to end up going through it. 
Oh, First Thessalonians five. Okay, verse one. For verse two, for you yourselves are fully aware that the day of the Lord, which is a phrase that's used, if we use apply the historical principle and you go back to the Old Testament, the day of the Lord has to do with the wrath of God coming upon the world. Will come like a thief in the night. Um, verse three of chapter five. While people are saying there is peace and security, then sudden destruction will come upon them as labor pains come upon a pregnant woman and they will not escape. But you, in verse 4, but you are not in darkness, brothers, that that day, for that day to surprise you like a thief, for you are all children of light, children of the day. We are not of the night or of darkness. So then let us not sleep as others do, but let us keep awake and be sober. For those who sleep, sleep at night, and those who get drunk are drunk at night. But since we belong to the day, the day, let us be sober, having put on the breastplate of faith and love, and for the helmet, the hope of salvation. There's hope again. For God has not destined us for wrath, but to obtain salvation. Read that as deliverance, because he's talking to save people here, so that's he's not being redundant. But to obtain deliverance through our Lord Jesus Christ who died for us so that whether we're, we are awake or asleep, we might live with him. Therefore, encourage one another and build one another up just as you're doing. So we, we can get more into the wrath of God and we probably will in the future, but I didn't want to, <clears throat> I wanted to make sure we didn't adjourn from here before we <clears throat> look at the application of that and who that applies to and how that we are not children of wrath. So we see wrath. Revelation chapter 6, right off the bat, wrath. And we, right off the bat, you've got one quarter of the earth destroyed. In today's terms, that would be about 2 billion people. So, but we're not appointed to wrath. So that's why it's a comfort to your point, Kevin. That's why it's a comfort, because we aren't going to see wrath. These things aren't going to happen. But for the believer right now, the church, that's not going to apply to us. Questions, comments, further. This is just introduction, but I want to get you, I want to get, wanted to give you the lay of the land of all the confusion that's out there and maybe some tools and how to inter interpret it and understand it. Because now what we're going to do as we go on and we start actually opening up the Bible and going through some passages, applying some of these principles and understanding, well, how do we understand this? Because why does this camp over here say this, but yet this camp over here says that? How do we harmonize that? Or do we harmonize it? Or how do we pick out which one is correct? Well, we have biblical principles now that we're going to apply. And I'm going to be listening for you all to jump in and say, well, wow, if we apply this principle here, that doesn't make sense because we're not supposed to see wrath. So how can that be about us? Okay. I can. I, I would like to say something if I don't, if you don't go mind. Ahead. Go ahead. Um, as a modern Christian, right, yeah. in today's society, uh, I can only speak for myself. I can't speak for anyone else. Uh, but having the absolute faith of Christ, right, I find myself doing things that I would not. Um... So maybe not facing the wrath, but there are still consequences to actions. So, Which is to your earlier, Hillary, your earlier point you're making where we sometimes get confused wrath with judgment or with discipline. Right. And that's, and that's, I think that's what I was trying to articulate is that <clears throat> we will still face consequences for our choices. Sure. Right. We live I in mean, a cursed world and we're sinful. If you, so. if you, if you disobey God's law, um, you're going to face consequences. Yeah. Right? That's, not they're, they're, that's not judgment. But that's, but that's not wrath. No. Right. No. And, and I think that was the clarification I wanted to make. Yeah. Wrath is uh, for those who uh, choose not to hear, for those who uh, hear and say no. You know, to have with it all. Now, a good, a good example, a way to look at that is when you're reading the Old Testament is you will see wrath upon Israel, but 
because Israel is God's chosen people, were every individual in Israel saved? Every person of, person of faith? They weren't, were they? So that's another thing we'll be looking at. So thank you. We'll adjourn from this and we'll set up for church. We will pick up.